Okay, everybody. How are we doing today? Well, that was, come, come on, you got to give me a little bit better than that. There we go. Yeah. So my name is Paul. Uh, I really appreciate all of you coming. Uh, this has been a brainchild of uh, myself and my, uh, my, part, my business partner, Dave Clausen. And uh, we are so glad to be doing this um, for, for the community and, and really trying to grow space for everyone here. And uh, yeah, really, thank you so much for coming. We really, really appreciate it. To everyone at home who's watching this live stream, thank you so much. We appreciate you too. And uh, we hope you continue to kind of follow this. And all of our live streams are going to be uh, chopped up and thrown up onto YouTube so everybody can see that. Sorry the live stream for the music isn't happening right now. We're still recording all of that and we'll get that on YouTube too. Okay, so before I begin, let me go and get a quick survey of the room. Who, who here has grown or cultivated any kind of mushroom? Okay, a few people maybe attempted, kinda. Who here is like quasi interested in growing mushrooms? Okay, cool, there we go. So this talk is, you know, forgive me because it, it's gonna have a lot of information. So this might be a little bit of an overload, but I wanna make sure that all of you are armed with as much knowledge as possible. And uh, with this going to be on YouTube, you can always go back and rewatch it over and over and over again just to get all the little details you may have missed. So no worries on trying to capture all of this in your brains right now in this moment. Just be here with me and uh, let's go ahead and go through this and I'll get you guys up to speed. And if you do have any questions, feel free to just like raise your hand in the middle of the talk and I'll find a stopping point and go ahead and, and call on you. Um, I, I don't have any issues with people. If you have like an immediate question, I'm more than willing to answer it. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and give a, you know, a talk on like intro to mushroom cultivation. We're gonna talk about everything from making spawn bags, to culturing, making auger plates, liquid cultures, uh, substrates, pretty much everything you would possibly need to know. But first off, we need to start with terminology. So what is mycelia or mycelium? It is generally considered the roots of the mushroom. Uh, there's two different types of mycelia. There's primary mycelia and secondary mycelia. Primary mycelia is monokaryotic, meaning it only has one nuclei in its cell. Uh, the secondary mycelia is the mycelia you generally see, like the fluffy white stuff either growing when you, when you peel back some leaves in the woods, you see some fluffy my, mycelia growing, the white stuff, that's always secondary mycelia. And it's dikaryotic, mean it ha, meaning it has two nuclei inside of its cell. And so the, in order to be able to sexually reproduce, it needs to be secondary mycelia, needs to be dikaryotic. And, uh, and that's, that's how it's able to sexually reproduce, is because two spores that are monokaryotes will germinate and then they will touch each other. And when they do, they form a clamp connection. And when it's undergoing that clamp connection, it will share the nuclei with the other cell. If they are compatible, uh, they will then uh, move forward together as a dikaryotic system. Okay, and so next, spores is the sexual gametes that are produced by the mushroom fruiting bodies. It's the, uh, they come in many different colors, shapes, and sizes, but it's what's ejected out of the basidiocarp or the mushroom from the gills. Next, we're gonna talk about grain. So when I talk about grain, I'm talking about just pretty much any cereal grain. We're talking corn, rye, millet, wheat, uh, uh, sorghum. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. Mushrooms will grow on all of it. So you just kind of pick whatever's available and what is easy for you to get your hands on and what works for your budget, and you can rock and roll from there. Next, we're gonna talk about spawn. So spawn is like the egg or the seed of the mushroom. So you take your culture, you then inoculate your grain under sterile conditions, and then from there, that will colonize that grain, and then that, that giant block of culture, that colonized material, is then called spawn. And you can use that spawn to inoculate your substrate. And so a substrate is a bulk material that is designed for fruiting mushrooms. So you can, while you can fruit directly from grain, 
it generally doesn't work very well because grain uh, has a very specific carbon nitrogen ratio depending on the type of mushroom that you're growing it may have a different requirement for fruiting as far as its carbon and nitrogen ratios and so that's what your substrate for your substrate is there in order to meet those carbon nitrogen ratio requirements so that it is able to form a beautiful fruiting body next we're going to talk about contamination so contamination isn't like a single thing it's pretty much anything that is not your culture of interest so if you're growing bacteria or yeast or other fungi that is all a contaminant it may be great uh, in the real world for plants or for humans or you know whatever it has a place in the world but in your culture it is in the way uh, just like weeds in your garden, they're all medicinal to some degree, uh, but when it's sitting next to your bell pepper or your tomato plant, it's a weed. Boom. Got to get it gone. And then next is transferring. Transferring is just taking a culture from uh, uh, one environment and moving it into a completely new environment, generally an uncolonized environment. And then cloning is when you're taking a live tissue sample from a mushroom and then you're putting that onto an auger plate or something of that ilk and you're generating secondary mycelia from it. What most people uh, may or may not know is that the, the entire thing is mycelia. It's all mycelia. The mushroom's mycelia, the mycelia's mycelia, it's all mycelia. So if you take a bit of a mushroom and under the right conditions let it sit, it will revert back into mycelium. It'll get fluffy and white and start to spread out and look for a comfy environment to start digesting and growing. So the most important thing that you got to figure out first when you're working with mushrooms is a sterile environment. So there's lots of different ways to do this and we're gonna go through the you know the the lowest the cheapest option all the way up to the most expensive option. And so starting with a still air box or an SAB. If you're on the internet, people like to call it SAB a lot. And so generally, it's just a Tupperware that you can go and cut some holes into it. And uh, you can Lysol the inside of the box, spray Lysol into the air in the box, put all your stuff in there and clean it up. And it's just a way for you to create an environment where the air is still enough that you can do transfers, even in an environment that's not perfectly clean or sterile, and be able to get pretty good results. And so this could be as cheap as like maybe, you know, 20 bucks, 50 bucks. I've made still air boxes out of uh, styrofoam coolers that were like $2 and used some saran wrap to cover the top. So, you know, you can go as cheap as you want to. Um, but the, the more expensive the setup, the easier it is to, to run away from contamination. And so for a little bit more money, you can go and get one of these still air boxes off of Amazon. They're like 60 to 100 bucks. Um, I know making your own is like super cool, but they already have an Amazon. You can, you can get it for pretty cheap. So they're generally a little bit bigger. They have these little, little things for your arms. Makes it just a little bit more convenient and easier to use. Next is like a HEPA flow unit. Uh, these have particulate filtration of 99.95% uh, generally. So the air that's coming out of it is like really, really clean. Um, if you're going to take this hobby super, super seriously and you're like, you know what, I'm going to keep doing this for a while, you might as well grab one. If you're going to get one, do yourself a favor, do not buy a used unit. If you buy a used unit, you don't know the mileage on the filter. If you don't know the mileage on the filter, then you can be doing sterile work in front of it and it can contaminate everything that you're working with. Because if it has like a very high uh, load already in it, then uh, eventually you're going to be diffusing those contaminants through the filter and then into your cultures. And ironically, the, the outer case with the blower motor and everything costs maybe 100 to 150 bucks. But if you're going to go direct to a dealer and buy the filter, it's like $600. But you can generally buy the entire unit brand new for anywhere between 300 to 500. So it's not really worth trying to get like an old unit and then buy a new filter. It's easier just to go and stock eBay and see if you can just find a whole unit and just go from there. And the last option is a HEPA flow hood, generally made out of stainless steel. They come in four foot, six foot, eight foot. They're pretty darn expensive. Um, I've, I've got one, I love it. 
Uh, I, started, I started here and kind of went all the way down over the, uh, the past uh, 10 ish years of cultivation. Um, but even with this option as great as it is, uh, if you're a mushroom farm, you can afford multiples of these as opposed to buying one of these. And so, you know, it might be better just to stick with having a whole bunch of HEPA flow units and then making a whole line of them and working from there. So let's go on to auger. So the, when, you're, when, you're, when you're doing mushroom cultivation, you got to start somewhere and generally you start with auger. Either you're buying a, a spore syringe or a liquid culture syringe or it doesn't really matter whatever you're starting with, then you can go directly to grain, but in order to make sure that you are able to keep the culture going and that you're going to have it for an extended period of time, auger place is a great way to start. So here's a uh, couple of recipes that you can use. PDA, which is made from potatoes, potato starch and dextrose. Uh, LMEA, which is light malt extract. Uh, usually with some uh, 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 water and auger. And then the recipe that I tend to use is kind of a, a knockoff of uh, Paul Stamets' recipe and a couple other people. It's a very general mix uh, using the yeast extract for mineral content, the peptones for protein, and then dextrose is my sugar, uh, and the auger. So auger, I, didn't, I don't know if I went over this, but auger is like a, it's a vegan uh, gelatinous substance that you can use in order to create a solid media for your mushrooms to grow on. Um, and so going back to, to dextrose, what's interesting about dextrose, a lot of people will use uh, caro syrup or honey or the light malt extract. There's lots of different sugars you can use. All of those sugars will work. The reason why I like to use dextrose is because cellulose is made up of dextrose monomers. So dextrose is what makes up, you know, when they, so when it's folded in one conformation and then it's flipped around, that's what makes up cellulose. Cellulose is what makes up all of the living plants on earth. And so when mushrooms are digesting plants, they're digesting the cellulose down into dextrose. And so dextrose is kind of the lowest common denominator as far as sugars go for what the mushrooms are naturally consuming in the environment. So that's why I tend to like to use it and I seem to get good results with it. So. Um, it's the supplies you'll need in order to make auger plates. You'll obviously need some auger plates, uh, like a mason jar to put all of your ingredients in, your ingredients, gloves, pressure cooker, isopropyl, uh, and some sort of sterile environment and some parafilm to wrap up your plates. And the process is pretty simple. You just mix all of your ingredients into a mason jar. You give it a good shake to make sure it's thoroughly mixed up. Uh, and then from there, you're going to put it inside of your pressure cooker and pressure cook it for anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes at 15 PSI. Some people say 15, some people say 20. I will tell you for a fact that if you go over 20, you will mess up your auger and it will get over overcooked. And uh, as much as humans don't like overcooked food, neither do the mushrooms. So, um, and then from there, you can go and dispense 20 to 25 mils in a 100 millimeter plate. Or if you're using uh, other sizes, you can do what you like. Uh, I tend to run uh, the 25 milliliter specifically because the, the thicker the auger, the longer it lasts inside of long-term storage. N nothing worse than putting all this effort into making plates and then forgetting about the plate and leaving it somewhere and then coming back to it and then it's all dried up. And you're like, no, my culture. So uh, the thicker the plate, the more nutrition it has, the longer it generally will last. Uh, also, the, it just has a little bit more water that helps to keep it alive a little bit longer. And then after you make your plates, you want to make sure to go and let the auger fully solidify before you put parafilm on it. I've tried to rush the process and ended up with goop all over my table. So definitely make sure it's fully solidified before you uh, try and wrap it. So next we're going to talk about liquid culture, which is a nutrient enriched broth that you can use to grow uh, fungal mass. And so what's great about it is that you can make a lot of liquid culture in a very short amount of time with few resources. And with that liquid culture, be able to inoculate a lot of spawn bags or substrate. And so you can bulk up a single colony very, very, very quickly with liquid culture. The only downside with liquid culture is that it's very easy to contaminate. So when you're dealing with a solid media, your contamination has to move from one side of the media to the other side of the media in order for it to affect your cultures. When you're dealing with a liquid culture, the entire thing's a liquid. 
It can just go wherever it wants to go. And so it's very easy. All you need is one bacterial cell to get into that liquid. And given enough time, it will reproduce to a point where it will outcompete your culture. So that's where having a good quality sterile environment, or at least having a very high tech, I say high tech, but uh, a liquid culture set up with uh, uh, like a little air patch and, and, a, and a, a, a plunger, all that will, will definitely help make sure that you don't end up dealing with contamination. And so the big question is, is everybody does something a little bit different as far as the recipe. I like to use a 1% sugar recipe. Uh, it just ends up working better for me. I've done higher sugar content recipes, and I've just noticed that the extra nutrition can lead to quicker contamination. And so if I use a lower amount of sugar, it gives my mushrooms a better chance to outcompete anything that may or may not have gotten into that culture. And if all the food is gone, there's nothing left for contaminants to eat, therefore it's not eating, and your liquid culture is gonna stay in pretty good condition. Uh, to do all of this, it's very, very simple. You can go and just mix up, take your mason jar, add some tap water, some caro syrup, or you know, your sugar of choice. Uh, weigh it all up, mix it together, give it a good shake. Uh, you can use pretty much whatever water you want, except for um, like uh, hydronium water, so water that's been purified with ozone. So any ozonated water, like if you're going to a Kroger or a Publix or just a supermarket, uh, sometimes when you're buying water, it'll say distilled, and then it'll also say like purified with ozone. Uh, that type of water it will not really work very well. It's better uh, just to stick to either using distilled water or tap water. I've done experiments with both and found that tap water works very, very effectively. And so I just run it with tap water and have not had any issues. I'm sure there's people out there that would probably be like, whatever, but either way, I, I haven't had any problems with tap water. So that's, that's what I usually run. And it's very similar setup with the auger. You're gonna put it in your pressure cooker at 15 PSI for 15 to 20 minutes. You don't wanna go over 20 minutes because it can denature uh, your product and caramelize the sugars. So 20 minutes is kind of the max for this. And then of course, when you're about to use it, make sure it's fully cool before you inject your culture in there. You don't want to cook your culture in your jars. And so in order to inoculate your liquid culture, you're going to place it inside of your sterile environment. You're going to wipe everything down. And so you, know, you can insert an auger wedge. That's a very common thing. People just take a piece of their auger, put it into the liquid, close it back up, give it a good shake let it colonize. Another way of doing it is to take a syringe with a little bit of distilled water, you know, or at least sterile water, and you're gonna take that sterile water and inject it onto the surface of your culture and give it a little scrape, and then you're gonna suck it back up, and what that does is it creates itty bitty little tiny mycelia bits that you can then inoculate into your jar over here, and that way uh, you don't you, you, you don't have to necessarily open the jar in order to put a piece of auger in there. And then from there, once it's fully colonized, generally takes about seven to 10 days, 14 days max, before your uh, colony will have eaten all the sugar inside of your, your jar. And then I usually use 10 milliliters for a four pound bag. If you're using a smaller bag, you can use less. But this is a situation where using more is more. The more you put in there, the more, the quicker it's going to end up growing. Because it's just like if you're putting spawn into a substrate bag, the amount of spawn that you put in there, if you put in an itty bitty bit, it's going to take a really long time for that itty bitty bit in order to grow. If you put in a lot, then it's going to colonize that material very, very quickly. So, you know, you, it's up to you to kind of play around with it and see what, uh, what works for you. Um, but that's the general go-to there. Uh, from there, I just want to just quickly go over like this whole high tech versus low tech type of deal. So if you have a big laminar flow hood or you got like one of those laminar flow units, then you can just take your liquid culture jar, pop it open, no problem, take your culture, add it, no issues. If you're using a still air box, I would definitely recommend getting something that has a little breathing port and an injection port. Uh, that way you never actually have to open the jar because opening the jar in a still air box, there is still stuff floating around. As much as you, it, you try to make it a still air 
box, uh, the error is never going to be perfectly still because you're moving inside of that box. And so because of that, there is always a risk of contamination. So if you're using this water, sterile water syringe technique in combination with using one of these setups, then the chances of you having success with your liquid culture, even in like a really, really low tech setup, is going to be much, much, much higher. And so, you know, if you have a higher tech setup, then you can use lower tech equipment and just use like a standard mason jar. No breather port, no nothing. I've had that work very, very well for me. Otherwise, you definitely want to use something like this. And one last thing is that anytime you are making these jars, you don't ever want to fill them more than maybe two thirds full. The culture still needs to breathe. Mushrooms are not plants. They don't photosynthesize and they don't breathe in CO2. They breathe in oxygen just like all the other animals and all the other insects and all that, everything else on earth, they all breathe in oxygen. And so if you fill it all the way up with liquid, you are leaving very, very, very little air in that jar in order for the mushrooms to be able to breathe. And there's not a ton of dissolved oxygen just natively in the water, so it'll consume that very quickly. And so if you don't leave enough headroom in there, it'll end up just suffocating. And while it will, it will, it's okay with being in a high CO2 environment, your culture is just not going to <clears throat> completely fill out the jar and do all the things it's supposed to do. And then when you put it into that substrate bag or that spawn bag, hit the ground running like it's supposed to. And so let's go and, and give a quick little talk about spawn bags, substrate bags. So there's several different types. And I'm going to take these out and kind of show them and then pass them around so you guys can play with them and feel them and touch them. But there's uh, generally two types of bags. You have bags you would use for spawn, which are kind of like these little guys. And then you have bags that you would use for substrate, which tend to be these bigger guys. You can use these big guys for spawn too. If you're going to do that, I would definitely recommend something like this, the pillow style, with all of these breathing strips so that it can get plenty of air in order to, to, to not overheat. Uh, I have put spawn into these bigger bags, but what ends up happening is that when these big bags are sat upright, it's so full and the colony is breathing and producing so much heat from digesting that very nutritious material that it can easily overheat itself. It doesn't have heat regulation. It only regulates its, its heat uh, by the environment that it's in. And so if you're going to run a giant spawn bag, you either need to be cooling the room or you can lay it on its side like you would with these pillow styles so that it's a, it has more surface area to go and get rid of that heat more effectively. And so with, with spawn bags, here, I'll start passing this around. Cheers. Get a, get a feel for them. You grab one. Thank you. Here you go. Thank you. And so with these spawn bags, there's kind of the three S's. There's the shape, the size, and the supplier. And then so with the uh, uh, supplier, you're going to have to go and find somebody that works for you. There's lots of different suppliers. They're all a little bit different. It's just a matter of finding the size that you need for the type of cultures that you're growing and then being able to match that uh, with whoever you're able to get it from at a reasonable price. The next big thing to talk about is filter patches. So the filter patches, there's generally three different sizes. There's a 0.2 micron, a 0.5 micron, and a 5 micron and they all kind of do different things. So the five micron is the biggest size, and generally that is reserved for substrate bags. And the reason why is because when the mushroom, excuse me, is trying to initiate into a fruiting phase, it needs a higher oxygen environment. And so that five micron patch allows for more gas exchange, which is able to help push it into that fruiting phase. Uh, you're still gonna need to cut the bag and it, engage it in that high O2 environment by poking a hole or cutting it or whatever, but at least it's, it's setting it up uh, to, to want to start fruiting immediately. So the 0.2 to 0.5 micron 
is mostly just reserved for spawn bags. And what ends up happening is it's, you use those tiny little those, uh, filter patches for two, two reasons. So the first reason is that most contaminants are about one micron in size. Like the smallest contaminants you're going to find are just over a half a micron to one micron. So if you're using a five micron patch for spawn, there is a chance that you may contaminate your spawn bag, especially if you're shaking it up all the time, right? Because the more you shake it, the more you're pushing that air in and out of that filter patch. And so using a smaller patch just helps to protect your culture a little bit better so that it has less of a likelihood of contamination. The other really important factor is that small filter patch also doesn't allow for a lot of gas exchange. And so the mushrooms, in order to stay in a more vegetative state, require high CO2 content. So if you're trying to fruit mushrooms, requires lots of oxygen. If you're trying to get it to stay growing, it needs high CO2. And so that high CO2 content just pushes the mushrooms to continue in its vegetative state and looking for nutrients around it. And, uh, and that's kind of why you, you would use those styles of filter patches. Now the difference between the 0.2 and the 0.5 is kind of subjective. I've not really found a large difference between them myself when I've been using them. I've used both, never had any issues, grew tons of spawn, never had a problem. Um, but it's generally going back to your supplier. It's what you can find for the price that you, you're looking for and what's available to you in your area. So, and then lastly, the other, other option is getting them with injection ports. They do come with injection ports. It's a lot more expensive. You're generally going to pay a buck to two bucks per bag, sometimes in bulk. That's the bulk price. Uh, the shortcut to that is just getting some red RTV silicone. You just get a normal bag, you put a little blob of red RTV silicone on there, wait for it to fully cure, and uh, that will, can serve very easily as an injection port. After you use your culture and inject into it, just place a piece of tape over it, bada bing, bada boom, you saved yourself a whole bunch of money. So, okay, now that we're done with bags, now we, I need to tell you how to use them. So, in spawn preparation, you're generally going to pick a grain. A lot of people use a lot of different types of grain. The one thing that you want to make sure is that if you're going to use bird seed in particular, try to find bird seed that didn't, does not have any sunflower seeds. The problem with sunflower seeds is there's a little air pocket inside of the hole of that seed, and that little air pocket can prevent proper sterilization. And I'm sure there's people on the internet that'll say, well, I've had it work. Yes, it can work. I'm just letting people know that the likelihood of it contaminating is significantly higher. I've tried to run bird seed that had uh, sunflowers in it and ran into so many walls uh, that I decided that it's just not worth it anymore. The easiest thing is because it has that little air pocket, the seeds float to the top. So you just dunk all your seed in water. This, the sunflower seed floats right to the top, and you can just skim it off the surface. Bada bing, bada boom. No worries there. Uh, the general process that most people use is this kind of uh, soak, rinse, simmer method. Uh, it was popularized uh, by Paul Stamets in his cultivation book. It's very, very common. And so generally the process goes, you take the grain, you soak it in water overnight. That next morning you drain the water, you rinse the grain in order to get out any sort of dust or dirt that might have settled in there. And then you're going to go and put it in a big pot and cook it until that grain swells up and it's nice and big right to the point that it's about to burst. Not at the point that it bursts, but just right to the point where it's about to. And then after that, you drain and cool, pack it into the bags, sterilize it for two and a half hours at 15 PSI. So one thing to note that's pretty interesting is that I, I did like a little mini study on water absorption for rye and wheat. Those are the two grains that I tend to run just because they're so cheap and you can buy them in bulk in 50 pound bags. So that's what I like to use. And you can get them organic. So it's just, a, it's just good for me. And what I notice is that within the first 30 minutes, it will absorb 25% of its weight in water. And if you let it sit for a full 24 hours, it's only getting another you know, 10, maybe 14% water. So if you wanted to do a quick run in making your spawn bags. You don't necessarily need to let it soak all night. You can pretty much just let it soak for about an hour. And after that, you can then you know, drain it and throw it into a pot and cook it. But what I, the way that I make my spawn bags is I do a no soak, no rinse. 
I've been doing this for years and never had any issues. Uh, and it definitely gives me a lot less hassle because I'm not having to, you know, deal with heavy things and draining stuff and cleaning stuff. I don't have to worry about any of that. I just take the grain, I take the water, I add it to the bag. Uh, I'll then go ahead and seal the bag, tape it up, put it in the cooker, cook it for uh, at 15 PSI for two to two and a half hours, and I'm ready to rock and roll. The, my recipe for a four pound bag is roughly 1,100 grams of grain, 700 grams of water, and that gives me a water content of roughly 50%. And so if you're going to do it this way, the one thing that's really, really, really important is your water content. And so you would think, oh, well, I'll just add, you know, if I want 50% water, I'll just add 50% water to it. Well, the problem with that thought process is that the grain already has water in it. It's not completely dehydrated. And so if you're adding 50% water to something that already has a water content of 10%, now all of a sudden that grain is 60% water, 10% over what you originally were intending. And so that's where, it, you know, you can go and call up a supplier, like if you're getting, uh, you know, 50 pound bags of grain, you can go and call the manufacturer or the supplier and they should be able to give that information to you, like a crude protein content, crude water content, all of that type of stuff. Uh, if you cannot find that information or they aren't able to give it to you, Google will assist you and it will give you like a just very, very general roundabout of there's roughly X percent water in that, ten, that type of material and you can can go and do all of your calculations from there. They're pretty simple. So uh, one thing also, when you're moving on to sterilizing your spawn bags, you want to make sure that your spawn, the filter patch is facing out. It's not rolled in or tucked or like wedged in between another bag. I used to do it that way. I did it that way for many years. And for many years, I would check my pressure cooker and have bags that exploded. And the reason why is because the filter patch is there for gas exchange. If you block the filter patch, there is no gas exchange. As the water, the moisture inside of the bag and the air uh, and the gas in that bag is uh, being heated up, it, it tries to expand. And uh, if it doesn't have a place to escape to, it's going to escape out the side of your bag. Uh, so to avoid having things explode and dealing with all that nonsense, I definitely recommend, kind of like in the pictures here, that you just pack it so that the filter patches are being exposed. The next thing is that you want to leave nice channels for steam penetration. There's a bunch of people that think that like making the steam work harder is somehow better, and it's not. It just means that steam is not getting to where it needs to be. In order for sterilization to occur, the steam has to be touching and heating up the entire mass to a certain temperature. If an area is completely blocked and it's not able to heat that area up effectively, then it's not gonna sterilize. So you wanna be consistent in the way that you pack it so that you leave nice little air gaps that are available for the steam to be able to get in and through the bags to, to penetrate and to disperse that heat evenly across your, your spawn or your substrate to make sure that it gets nice and sterile. I generally, uh, when I am using a pressure cooker, I will uh, fill it up with water. Sometimes I'll put a spacer in the bottom so I can add a little bit of extra water depending upon the size that you're using. Uh, I'll use like a glass or something. Uh, but I generally, if, if, it, if I'm having the water come up the side of the bag, uh, I, I don't really, if it's a good quality bag and it's sealed properly, water sh the only way water is going to get in is through that filter patch. And so if you only fill up maybe a third or halfway up the side of that bag, then when it starts bubbling, it's not going to get into that filter patch. Any more than that, and the likelihood of it bubbling over and into your filter patch is much higher. I saw a question in the back. Instapot? Sure. I mean, there, there are so many people online that get so freaking creative. I love it. I mean, people are just finding all sorts of ways, even, even people using like uh, Uncle Ben's because they, they have like the pre-made rice and you can just like, it's already at the moisture content and everything's hermetically sealed and they're just taking, you know, this Uncle Ben's rice that you can buy at the store for a buck or two and just injecting that without even needing a pressure cooker. So there's, there's a kind of like, so it really depends on what you're doing and that's, that's why I'm, I, I know this is like so much information, but I'm trying to arm you with enough info that you can say, okay, you know, what am I trying to grow? 
what's my budget? That being the most important factor. How much money do I want to spend on this hobby? And then from there, being able to decide, okay, like what are my resources that I can use to start cultivating what I want with the budget that I have? And so, you know, if, I, if you want to start growing mushrooms, that's the best way in my mind to approach it. And that way you can just get started. So you don't feel like you have to spend $1,000 on fancy equipment or, or build something that's super extravagant. You can go and just find what's going to suit your need right then and there. You know, if, if growing plants, uh, it, you know, the first time you tried to grow a plant, you were going hydroponic. That may be like way more than you need when really all you need is some dirt, some seed, sunlight, and water, right? So a very similar space for the mushrooms. Uh, I've seen people use Instapots and have great success. It, it is a pressure cooker. I, you know, I have not used an Instapot, so I, you know, as long as you can set that thing to run for a couple of hours, you should be good to go. Um, but yeah, there's you know the, the Uncle Ben's pre-made rice and all sorts of other stuff that also is like a very simple uh, hack so that really all you need is a still air box, a culture, your Uncle Ben's, and some tape. And you can just rock and roll from there. Uh, so I have noticed it, in the past I've had bags melt to the side of my pressure cooker. And that's generally because the stove element is heating the outer walls of the pressure cooker much faster and much hotter than the inside of the pressure cooker itself. And so when that happens, the plastic is rated for sterilization temperatures. It's not rated for your stove. And so the easiest way to avoid having some issues there with the melting is just to go and take a towel or a cloth of some sort. Make sure it's wet before you put it in there because if it's completely dry, you add a bunch of water to your pressure cooker, uh, the towel absorbs moisture. You know, you use it when you get out of the shower to get all the water off you. So it's going to do the same thing in that pressure cooker. So you just want to make sure that the, you know, whatever type of cloth you're using is nice and wet before you put it in there so it's not taking any moisture out of your setup. And then uh, develop a feel for what the bag look like, looks like after you cook it. Uh, you can overcook it. And, so, and you can also undercook it. And so that's where uh, gauging by your success, uh, every time you run a sterilization cycle, you need to have that feel of being able to smell it and to look at it and be like, okay, I think, I think this is done right. Uh, the last thing you want to do is go through all of this effort, everything that we had just mentioned, making auger plates, taking those auger plates, making a liquid culture, taking your liquid culture, making some spawn bags, inoculating those spawn bags with your liquid culture, only to find out it contaminates and then wondering, what happened? Was it my auger plate? Was it my liquid culture? Oh man, could it be my spawn bags? You don't want to have to go and start chasing the contamination trail. You'd rather be like, okay, I know it wasn't this, and I know it wasn't that, so it has to be you know, my culture, it has to be X, Y, and Z. And so getting a feel for the look and the smell of your material as you're cooking it, I find is really, really important, just to make sure it's like a double check so that if you pull it out and it's like, mm, this looks kind of undercooked, then you can always recook it. You know, put it, put it in for an extra hour. It's not gonna kill it. And you'd rather do that than inoculate it and then have it die on you. And then be like, wow, I just wasted all that time and effort. So, you know, important just to kind of get a feel, just to feel it out, see what, see what works for you depending upon the grain that you're using. A lot of people will talk about wet spots. Wet spots happen, they're not a big deal. It's a part of, is when, it, when the pressure cooker starts cooling down, uh, anytime you have water and cooling uh, and, and two different temperatures meeting, you get condensate. It's normal. Condensate uh, will accumulate. When that condensate accumulates, it settles. When it settles, things get wet. As long as the moisture content in the overall system is unchanged, then a wet spot, as soon as you go and mix it into your bag, it's going to work out and even out just fine. And you shouldn't have any issues. And then, as always, make sure you go and cool your bag before you use it. Don't, don't pull it directly out of a hot pressure cooker and immediately throw a culture in it. Chances of you kind of cooking and stunting your culture can be pretty high. And so let's move on to substrates. 
And so substrate being the material that you, you, that is designed for fruiting the mushrooms, not just bulking up the mass of the mushroom, but specifically fruiting the mushrooms. Many substrates tend to be agriculture waste products. And this is where uh, things can get really, really interesting, because you're like, what is agriculture waste? Right? Agriculture waste can be straw, it can be cottonseed holes, peanut holes, sawdust, pellets, wood chips, soybean, vermiculite, soil, cocoa core. I mean, there's, there's so many types of agriculture waste. There was a guy that showed me that he was able to take kudzu and chip it and use it to grow oyster mushrooms. So you can literally take anything that's a plant-based material and match that with the mushroom you're trying to cultivate and be able to cultivate mushrooms from it. Mushrooms, uh, you, you know, if you're, the only difference in that is you, whether you're dealing with primary decomposers or secondary decomposers because the carbon nitrogen ratio requirements for both are gonna be slightly different. You don't wanna try and grow a secondary decomposer directly on wood because wood is for primary decomposers just like you wouldn't wanna take an oyster mushroom and try and grow it in soil because it's not gonna like that. It needs a high carbon content in order to, to fruit the mushroom fruiting bodies. And so when making your substrate, there's a couple of different ways to do it. You can obviously sterilize it, the same way you sterilized your, your, uh, your, your spawn bags two, and a half, two to two and a half hours in a pressure cooker. You can also pasteurize it. So by pasteurizing it, you leave some of the good bacteria left over to help protect that material so that it's able to help enable your mushrooms to grow and to reduce the likelihood of contamination. And so the benefit of pasteurization is that you don't need a sterilized environment to inoculate something if it's pasteurized. You would want the space to be like mildly clean, but it doesn't have to be perfectly clean. There's people growing mushrooms in third world countries who are just pasteurizing their material. And if they can do it in a hut in the middle of nowhere, I guarantee you can do it in your home. So there's two different types of pasteurization. You can do a hot pasteurization, which is at around 145 to 160 degrees for about an hour to two hours. Uh, there's, it's, it's variable because it all depends on uh, the heating element you're using, how long it's sitting, um, how effective that heat is transferring into your material. And, and so that's why it's kind of a range. It's not an exact science. It's something that you'll have to kind of discover for yourself. And then there's cold pasteurization using hydrated lime, where you generally take like a, a container, you fill it full of water, uh, in this case, a, you know, 50, a 45, 55 gallon bucket uh, or a barrel, and then you put about four cups of hydrated lime in it, and you can let your material soak for 12 to 24 hours. I had great success with this with outdoor beds. I took a bunch of straw, cold pasteurized it, put it in a giant garden bed, uh, inoculated, inoculated it with oyster mushrooms and was pulling out so many mushrooms I stopped picking them. It was like almost over 100 pounds of mushrooms coming out of this thing. It was, it, it, was, it was too much. My fridge was too full. I had no one else to give it to. So there they were, uh, just fruiting all on their own. And so, you know, the, there's, there's kind of pros and cons. It, and it really, at least with the substrate, you, you have to think about how nutritious it is. And so if you're running a very highly nutritious substrate, nutritious being it has lots of nitrogen and protein available, then a lot of other things love that too. And so if you're running a higher nitrogen type of substrate, you're probably going to want to move towards sterilization and then inoculating that in a sterile environment to ensure that no other bad cultures, contaminants can go and find their way in. If you're running something that's a lot less nutritious, that's a lot higher in carbon content, like straw or sawdust or something like that, then you may have a lot more success with being able to just do a hot pasteurization or a cold pasteurization, depending upon whether you're putting it in bags or not. If you're doing like an outdoor bed, you can go ahead and do cold pasteurization all day, no problem. If you're making substrate bags, uh, let's say for growing oysters in bags, that you would have a hard time cold pasteurizing, you're gonna probably wanna hot pasteurize that. And so I just wanted to kind of briefly go over enrichment of the bags, the types of things that you can use to help your cultures grow better. And so there's gypsum. Gypsum is great for helping with water absorption and clumping inside of your bags. It also provides a small amount of available calcium and sulfate ions, which are good for the mushrooms to be able to grow. Uh, a lot of people think that gypsum can adjust pH. Technically it does. 
but it can take up to six months or, or more for gypsum to be able to make that calcium more readily available. So if you're trying to add calcium directly to your culture, it may be better to use something like hydrated lime, which can also immediately adjust the, uh, the, uh, the pH of your substrate, making it more alkaline. So if you're using something that has spent coffee or that has this high nitrogen content, it will push your pH down, aka making it more acidic. And the mushrooms like to be in a more neutral or very slightly alkaline environment. And so you're going to want to make sure that you use a little bit of hydrated lime to help nudge the pH up to make it a slightly more basic so the mushrooms are just in a happier growth space. Mushrooms don't per generally prefer, at least the cultures that most people are trying to cultivate, don't generally grow well in acidic environments, but all the contaminants do. Bacteria loves acidic environments, uh, trichoderma, uh, aspergillus niger, all the co cobweb mold, all that other stuff loves acidic environments. So, you know, the more alkaline you're able to, you know, make it within reason at neutral or slightly above neutral, the more you're setting your culture up for success so that it can do what it wants to do. And so carbon nitrogen ratio is really important. I've been kind of talking about alre that already, but I'll just go ahead and reiterate. So there's a difference between primary and secondary decomposers. Primary decomposers are the ones that are breaking down the big macromolecules, in this case, most mostly just cellulose. They're taking cellulose from plants, either from trees or from your agriculture waste, and they're breaking that down into dextrose, using that sugar to go and continue its growth cycle. And then what happens when that culture is done? Well, that's where the secondary decomposers come in. After that material has been broken down by a primary decomposer, it generally is like a soil-esque material that the secondary decomposers then swoop in and are able to start breaking down that material. The main difference between them as far as their requirements, that primary decomposers love high carbon content, secondary decomposers love high nitrogen content. And yes, there, you know, there's all mushrooms uh, are more than willing to be trained in order to grow in the environment that you're giving it. It wants to breed. It wants to live. You know, take a human out of their element, put them somewhere else, they'll probably struggle for a bit, and then they're going to figure out how to survive, right? And that's how we've been able to spread all over the world. Mushrooms, they do the exact same thing. So while with immediacy, they may not do that right on the front end, and it'd be better to give them exactly what they need, uh, you can train mushrooms to do all sorts of crazy stuff. People have used mushrooms to remediate pesticides and all sorts of other types of uh, uh, radioactive waste and all sorts of crazy stuff. So, you know, given a will, it will find a way. Question? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of primary decomposers you'll find growing like directly on a tree. So that'd be like your oysters, your lion's mane, um, your uh, and uh, Ganoderma, um, and so your secondary decomposers are mostly the mushrooms that are growing out of soil. So that'd be you know like your cubensis or you know agaricus, uh, that type of stuff. They 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 tend to more like a high nitrogen profile. Um, yeah, so pretty much anything that if you find growing on a tree, it's a primary decomposer and it, it likes that high carbon content. If you find it growing in soil, uh, you know, a, a, some more examples that are more mycorrhizal would be like chanterelles, black trumpets, morels. Those are your, those are your uh, secondary or tertiary decomposers and they're just kind of helping shuttle nutrients that are being generated in the soil by the bacteria and by everything else around it. So. This shows how to what? Um, how to cultivate reishi. Um, there's, there's, you pretty much cultivate it the same way you cultivate everything else. You get a culture, you inoculate it into either a liquid culture, and then from liquid culture to a spawn bag, or from an auger plate, or from a syringe directly into a spawn bag. Once the spawn bag is colonized, you can use that to inoculate into a high carbon environment. A lot of people will use sawdust, uh, a mixture of sawdust and wheat bran, because there needs to be a, a little bit of nitrogen in there in order for it to, you know, the carbon nitrogen ratio needs to be in a good space so it, that it wants to grow. Given a will, it will, you know, if you fill it just with sawdust, it will do something. Uh, and then from there, once, it's, once your substrate bag is fully inoculated, you just kind of let it sit 
And a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll cut off the tops and then take the bag and put that into a fruiting chamber. Uh, chamber meaning a Tupperware, uh, it could be a terrarium, it could be a grow tent, it could be a giant grow warehouse. You know, you can scale it as big or small as what you need to, but you can keep it in a fairly moist environment around, you know, anywhere between probably like 80 to 90% relative humidity and it will stay moist enough that it will start producing antlers. Uh, the taller your bag, the taller the antlers will be. And so the mushroom will produce a shelf once it reaches a high oxygen environment. So if you want it to shelf immediately, then you can cut the bag, to, you know, a couple inches above your substrate. But what most people will do is they'll let the bag stay tall and they'll let those antlers grow big and tall until they reach the top of the bag and then they'll start to kind of shelf out. And once it makes that, that little, that shelf, uh, the, the conch, it'll, they'll go ahead and harvest it at that point. But you grow, pretty much all mushrooms, you grow using the exact same formulation as far as auger, to either the liquid culture or grain, and then from the grain, you know, the liquid culture to the grain, and then from the grain to your substrate. The workflow is dynamically the same no matter what type of mushroom you're trying to grow. It's just more about the fruiting conditions that you're putting it in and the carbon nitrogen ratio that you're using in order to induce it, its, its want to go and sexually reproduce. And so, before, before I move on to the next slide, I wanted to talk really quickly about biological efficiency and what that means. Biological efficiency is the wet mass of the mushroom divided by the dry substrate times 100. It's just a way to calculate how uh, efficient the mushrooms are at turning the substrate that you're using into fungal material, into fruiting body material. And what's interesting is that when a lot of studies have been done on this, and in general, smaller bags have smaller yields but yield higher biological efficiency, while larger bags have much larger yields but have much smaller bioefficiency. And that's because the smaller bags are able to shuttle the nutrients. They don't, it doesn't have to shuttle the nutrients very far. It's a small container. So it's able to utilize all of that nutrition a lot more effectively and efficiently. Whereas with a big bag, it has to shuttle those nutrients much further along the fungal mass. And so that's why there's, there's you know, at least in theory, that's the reason why those, the biological efficiencies tend to be different. So, you know, if you're trying to go for a high BE, then you can have a lot of small bags. If you're just trying to go for bulk mass, then it's a lot easier to use giant bags because you can build up that mass a lot faster. Yep. Yeah, does shape influence biological efficiency? It really depends on what you're growing. It really depends on what you're growing. And what I mean by that is that some mushrooms prefer to grow in specific ways. Like oyster mushrooms don't mind growing in a giant block, right? Um, but maybe uh, if you're growing agaricus, um, agaricus being in soil, it's used to being in a landscape where it grows out and its surface area is, a, you know, earth. And so the further it can grow out, the happier it is. So it doesn't grow in a giant block. That's not its natural environment, is, is hunkering deep into a tree and then making a colonized space and then fruiting out of it. What it does is it grows across the soil and then colonizes as much as it possibly can with the water and nutrition that's available and then under, right, under the right conditions will fruit upward. So, you know, if you're, if you're growing something like agaricus, then taking your substrate and laying it sideways will help improve the biological efficiency because you're giving the mushroom the ability to grow the way it likes to grow as opposed to growing it straight up and down, which you know, may hinder its ability to produce because it mostly needs surface area to grow, whereas opposed to the oyster mushrooms, which don't need a lot of surface area, they like to focalize their nutrition from one point. You can poke a hole in the bag or make a cut, and then from that cut, it'll just psh, fruit a ton of mushrooms. Good? Thank you, sir. And so I know I'm kind of running a little lowish on time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed through this a little bit. There's only a couple more slides, I promise. And so when you're starting a culture, you can either start by buying your materials or you can make your own spore print. In order to make a spore print, you just take a piece of mushroom, you place it over something that can collect the spores, like a tin foil or a piece of paper, something like that. You're going to add water to the mushroom 
cap, uh, not that it's overflowing, just enough to saturate the top of the cap. The reason why is because water is what initiates the release of the spores. There is little basidia where the spores sit. It's a sac that as it fills with water, the sac expands, expands like a water balloon, and then it pops. And that's how it ejects the spores at a high velocity directly into the air. And so by adding that little bit of water to the cap surface, it's able to continue its fruiting process even when it's separated from the main culture. It, 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 the whole thing is still alive. It's all mycelia. It's still alive. So, and then for things that are hard to get spore prints from, you can always take gill samples. I've had some mild success with doing that. It really depends on where you collected the sample, whether it was outside or whether there was a heavy rain or you know, some other contaminant may have gotten to it first, but I have had success with taking gill samples. You can also do cloning from live tissue. Generally, you would just take the mushroom, split it in half, and then the uh, fuzzy material on the inside of the stem or the inside of the cap you can use uh, to put on an auger plate and start growing your secondary mycelia. In a high oxygen environment, like in an, on the surface of an auger, of auger in an auger plate, it's able to revert back into the mycelia and start running. And so with contamination, uh, there's really no way around it. You People try to transfer away from it, and that's the most common method that people use, just running away from contamination, picking a clean piece and transferring it, clicking a clean piece and transferring it. Um, it's not very effective. Uh, and so I suggest that you all come to my talk on cabin sequestering so you can learn this technique. Uh, because cabin sequestering is probably the most pivotal uh, culturing technique that's been innovated in almost the past hundred years. Yeah, it will be today. I'll be speaking six or seven again on that one. And it's very easy to do. And I have a video of how to do it this time. So upgrading my talk a little bit. Uh, and that way I can show you because it's, it's a great way of cleaning, especially bacteria and other fungal contaminants out of your culture pretty efficiently. And so there's generally two different morphologies of mycelia, tomatose and rhizomorphic. Rhizomorphic is this ropey stuff. Tomatose is this fluffy stuff. Uh, I've had both work very well for producing mushrooms. A lot of people swear that the rhizomorphic is better. Uh, I tend to agree that it's a lot more aggressive and that uh, it, it, tends, it can tend uh, to fruit a little bit better, but I've had stuff that came out tomatose that was able to compete with all the stuff that came out rhizomorphic. You know, two different uh, morphologies from the same plate and it fruited the same. So, you know. Uh, I'm going to leave it up to the online experts to tell me I'm wrong. Um, and so zoning. Zoning is the different selections on the plate. So you can see that all of this looks roughly the same. So I would call that zone one. And then you have a second zone here, a zone in the middle, and another zone here. And so when you're growing a culture, uh, there's generally a mix of phenotypes. There's lots of different uh, subphenotypes existing in that culture. And so getting a monoclonal culture, which is a culture that is only one genetic, it requires you to understand how zoning works. And then to be able to pick from the center of those zones in order to get the type of sample that you want. Um, not that running Something that has multiple phenotypes is bad. But just if you are trying to get very specific and you're trying to produce a lot of one specific genetic of mushroom, you want to understand zoning so you can do that. And the main difference between cloning and spores is spores, there's sexual reproduction. So when there's sexual reproduction, you produce a ton of phenotypes. When you're cloning, uh, you are, it's exactly what it sounds like. You're just cloning that piece. And so it's not producing any sort of genetic variation. Uh, if genetic variation occurs, it's generally from the environment stressing the mushroom into changing. It's not necessarily from the mushroom somehow taking in genetics from somewhere else and then altering itself. Um, and you can get much more consistent results with cloning, but you generate more variations with spores. And so what I generally will try to do is I will start with spore and generate a ton of phenotypes, and then I will run all those phenotypes, and then I will pick which one did the best, and then the best one I will clone. And then that way I can have a strong strain that I can keep running over and over and over and over again. And so putting it all together, you can go from auger to a spawn bag or auger to a liquid culture. You can then take that liquid culture, go to a spawn bag, and go from a spawn bag to another spawn bag, which is called grain-to-grain -grain transfers. 
And so you can bulk up one bag into 10 bags, 10 bags into 100 bags, 100 bags into 1,000 bags. So you can make a lot of mass in a very short amount of time. You can then take your spawn, use that to inoculate your substrate. So uh, inoculation rates are at least important in understanding that the more you put in it, the faster it's going to colonize. The less you put in it, the slower it's going to colonize. And it, so it really just depends on how quickly you need it to get done. Sometimes if I need something, I'm like, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm about three weeks out from being ready to go and fruit something. I'll do a low inoculation ratio just because I know it's going to take time. And that's OK. And then sometimes I'm like, man, I really need this to fruit like next week. So I'll just blast it with a ton of spawn just to get it colonized and get it going. And so when you're fruiting, uh, you generally want to start with you know, a higher humidity environment that has a little bit higher CO2 because it still needs to anneal because after you break up a bag or something, it needs to be able to reform in that new fruiting environment. And then once it's actually starting the pinning process, you want to drop the humidity down not so that you don't waterlog your culture and dramatically increase how much fresh oxygen is going into your culture. That way it's able to uh, go through in the fruiting uh, induction process properly. And so if you're fruiting outdoors, it's a little bit different than fruiting indoors as far as when you're fruiting outdoors, nature's doing a lot of that for you. And when you're fruiting indoors, you have to more, have a little bit more control over it. Uh, but regardless, you can train your mushrooms to suit your needs. So you just start cultivating, and eventually, after you go through the process enough times, it'll get used to growing on the type of grain you like to use. It'll get used to fruiting in the type of environment that you're able to provide, and everything should work well from there. And so thank you so much for your time. I very much appreciate all of you, and uh, I'll answer like one or two questions. Yep. Put it underneath a tree. Yeah, I mean, you can go and make a straw bed. You can, you can cold pasteurize it with hydrated lime like I was talking about. And don't worry because all of this is going to be on YouTube. So you can come back and rewatch this and look at the slides and all of that. So don't feel like you have to capture all of that information right now. But generally, like using straw or you can use like hardwood chips, you know, like wood chips. Um, you can go and pasteurize it using uh, a hydrated lime in a bucket full of water. You just kind of throw it all together, let it sit overnight. And then from there, you just want to make sure it's well drained. And then you can go and put it underneath your tree or inside of a garden bed or something. Something that's out of direct sunlight, not because the mushrooms don't like sun, but because sun means evaporation. And the culture has to stay wet. And if it doesn't stay wet and it dries out, it's going to die. So, you know, kind of like throwing a human in the desert. <laughs> you know, it's like, how long can it survive without water? Not long. So, uh, and then from there, you would just go and kind of maybe a layer of, uh, of your, your straw and then a layer of spawn and then a layer of straw. You kind of make a sandwich ending, you know, the starting with straw and ending with straw. That way it's nice and covered. Uh, if you're in a spot that does get a little bit of sun, you can use a landscape cloth to help provide, uh, provide a, a, an environment that allows for uh, air transfer and for moisture to get inside, but then blocks the UV radiation so it doesn't uh, evaporate so quickly. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Hey, Talia. Hey, August. Do you want to tell me? What are the insides of the seed when you have a vegetable? No, I said, what are the, what, what are the, what are the, yes, is the, the base? <laughs> yeah. What are the Uh, 
Uh, how much rain do you need? Uh, well, that's great because if you, if you don't get any rain, you can use a drip line or you can water it with a hose. You generally want to check it at least once a week, kind of just peel back some of the substrate layers, stick your finger in there. As long as it's wet, it's still alive and good to go. That was a great question. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, everybody, for your time. I really appreciate you. And we're ready to rock and roll.